So again, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lee Hamilton, and I'm Senior Product Manager at Geostat. And obviously the webinar that you've really signed up to, so firstly, thank you very much for, for your time this afternoon. Um, it's greatly appreciated and hope that you get some value from, from this discussion today. It's obviously on GeoSlam products um, and construction. So if you have any questions, please ask via the Q&A panel. Um, I won't have the panel up in front of me during the webinar, so we'll, I'll be answering these at the end. If there's any if there's any questions that I can't answer immediately, um, what I'll do is I'll take a note of your name and then look to email you uh, back with, a, with an answer after the webinar. Um, the recording will be emailed to all attendees. Like I said, any follow-up questions can be sent to either myself, uh, lee.hamilton at geoslam.com, or on the uh, on the email info at geoslam.com. Okay. So for for those who uh, don't know about Geoslam, we're a global market leader in, in Go Anywhere 3D mobile mapping technology, and our unique te technology is versatile especially in indoor and outdoor um, and underground uh, difficult access kind of areas. And what we like to do is we like to work with um, entrepreneurial, intrapreneurial, um, pioneering enterprise partners that wish to disrupt their industry or verticals by leveraging any kind of 3D spatial capture technology, uh, but obviously most notably GSM uh, in terms of uh, the mobile variety. So a brief timeline from 2013 to 2019, because that's kind of the area in which we, the kind of the mobile kind of handheld devices really started to uh, kick off for us as a business. So starting around about 2013 with a Z1, which is kind of this manual oscillating um, uh, device that you had to obviously oscillate yourself manually. Um, that was in 2013, and then bringing it forward had the Zebrevo, the launch of our, of our software to kind of process the data that is captured through the devices. Uh, the Zebrevo ops then went uh, to the Revo RT in 2017, so applying a real-time processing and also feedback um, when you're scanning around the areas which you which you're in. Followed a year later in 2018 by the Zeb Horizon, um, and that was after 3D laser mapping merged with GSLand and the two businesses coming together. And what I did was as a real catalyst to kind of leverage the strengths of GSLand's kind of commercial acumen um, versus the um, the in-depth and quality R&D uh, that we have uh, with uh, 3D laser mapping. And one of those outputs was the Horizon, uh, which uh, was obviously launched in, in 2018 for kind of more outdoor environments with its range of um, up to 100 meters. And then every year or every half year or whatever it is where we like to kind of in introduce releases in terms of a software to make our processing, our post-processing as robust as possible. Um, and obviously trying to improve our hardware as well. So last year was the year we launched Zep Pano, which is essentially the Zeb River RT with a uh, 360 degree panoramic camera on, on the top to capture or contextualize the environments being captured. And moving forward, uh, at the tail end of last year, we had another launch, which is the Zeb Discovery, which you can see on the right hand side there, which harnesses the kind of the versatility and uh, the quality of capture with the Zeb Horizon with an NC Tech 360 degree uh, panoramic camera on the top, mainly for kind of city mapping, cityscaping, those kind of applications. Now, GSLAM, we have kind of four core value propositions, um, or kind of our full value proposition contains four main pillars, and that's speed, simplicity, business intelligence, and automation. And speed and simplicity comes really um, as a result of just mobile mapping technology. So the speed in which you capture and the simplicity in which you pick up the scanner and obviously capture the environment that you're in. Business intelligence, so it's talking about taking that data and turning it into something which is information, turning to something that's actually meaningful for you as a business, but also for uh, the projects that you're working on. And also automation, we're clearly, we're always striving to improve any processes, workflows, products that we launch to market, either hardware or software, and incorporate some level of automation improvement in there to make your lives easier when using those products. And bring those all together, we are obviously trying to improve ourselves um, as the months and years go on. So for those who don't know Geostam, where can you find us? Well, we are headquartered in, a, in Nottingham, which is a kind of northern England in the United Kingdom. And we have seven global offices, 77 distributors and 53 countries. And that's the direct or indirect uh, presence within those 53 countries. 
So you'll be able to find our dealer network, or if not, we can we if you're struggling to find that, we can of course put you in contact with that if you'd like to email us at info at gslam.com. Now just to briefly talk about our product range and kind of building products to meet evolving customer needs. Again, this is this this evolving customer needs. You know, we're not staying still, we're not staying stagnant, we're constantly looking to engage with our end users, our customer base, to understand what their what their moving needs are and try and adapt our hardware and software capabilities to make sure that we, we meet the needs uh, moving forward. And the, the this is not exclusively uh, or exhaustively the, the product range that we have within, within GSLAM, but I think it's the ones that probably are going to be most useful within a construction or and uh, facilities management environment. Do you have a Zeb Reaver on the left-hand side? which is the real-time feedback, which kicks out around about 43,000 points per second. It's nice and light, it's about 850 grams, and has a range of about 30 meters. If you come onto the Zep Horizon, again, that range kind of um, extends a little bit to 100 meters, a little bit heavier, but 1.3 kilos is, is comfortable enough to have in hand through, through scan times as well. As we move through, we've also got the Discovery in the centre, which is newly launched for kind of cityscaping. So kind of out of the five products we've got on the page here, the Zev Discovery is probably the one which I wouldn't necessarily have um, as a kind of at the forefront of a construction project. However, as our understanding of construction facility facilities management progresses, um, we can certainly find uh, find a use for that. On the right of that, you've got the, the Pano, the Zeb Pano. So it's incorporating the, um, the technology of the Zeb Revo RT and having that 360 degree uh, Ricoh Theta V camera on the top of it as well to take photos, geotag within your point cloud and give you that kind of textualization to the environment which you're scanning. And lastly, when you kind of want to look at the entire estate from a bird's eye view, we obviously have the, the UAV, which you attach a Zeb Horizon uh, onto it as a, as a payload and scan as you would, but obviously in the air with a qualified uh, UAV pilot. So the five products um, in some in some detail. However, if you'd like to know a little bit more about the products uh, beyond what I've discussed today, please go to our website www.gsland.com and uh, there's a, a nice brochure in there which kind of details the products in there as well and a little bit more specification about why we put them to market and what specifically they do. We talk about workflow, so taking that hardware and processing it through software, obviously scanning it. Uh, we have the GSM devices and that captures point cloud as well as the high resolution imagery. You then kind of have a uh, .gslam file, which then you kind of import into a GSM hub, which is essentially the brain of, of the processing. And with that, you can do a number of things. So um, you can use Draw, which is kind of a package that is built with inside it, with a very powerful package, which I will go through later on. You can modify it, you can view it, and you can merge your scans as well. So you can do a, an incredible amount with, with Hub um, to in order to shape the point cloud and the data you want to get from it into something uh, meaningful and useful. Out of that, you can export into .laz with a Z, with an S, E57, uh, PLY, EWG files, and DXF. So kind of widely accepted file extensions for another kind of um, design and model making um, software packages out there. You can also mesh either um, well, through the kind of third party software. So taking that point cloud and um, meshing the planar services to give you the ability to create IFC classifications and importing that again into the associated and respective uh, software packages for design and also for model checking. Now I'm using Autodesk Revit, Navisworks and Recap Pro here. Um, that's just as an example, but there are many more software packages out there. Obviously, would it accept the, uh, the file extensions listed at the bottom under export as well. So we're not exclusively tied into Autodesk. This obviously can uh, has far, uh, far more far reaching um, opportunities outside of the Autodesk um, ecosystem. When you're capturing the devices, it is very local. So the data is kept it onto a, lo onto a data logger, which is on your persons as you're scanning around the, the environment. And that is either processed real time using the, uh, the, using the RT or if you're using Horizon, it's downloaded onto USB. And that is then processed locally on a laptop using Hub. So that tends to be the kind of the typical workflow for, for, that, kind of, uh, for that kind of element. So that's kind of a very basic uh, processing uh, workflow for construction. But as, as we go through later along, I'll kind of 
um, expand on that a little bit, show you a couple of videos in terms of what each of those elements mean and how that can add value to your workflow and your own to your project. Moving forward, um, you know, I'll, I'll mention this a lot, so I'll make uh, no apologies for it. We are a really exciting time within within GeoSlam at the moment, where we have a, a new chief product officer uh, who has been within the business for years and years, but a super intelligent guy, but now is spearheading product for us, which is fantastic news. We have a brand new product uh, management team. Um, obviously, with me coming in eight months ago, senior product manager, and we also have Matt Bester as well, and we've got a real good uh, sense of where we want to go moving forward. Obviously propped up by some super talented hardware, software and embedded team developers as well. So we've got a real good basis for progression. And one of these things on the roadmap is GSM Connect, which like I said, is, is an ongoing development. And essentially it's workflow automation tool and operating system. So it's about automation, it's about simplicity. It's about um, driving increased use technology where people want information, but not data. So the data is dumb. OK, and um, I'd like to just say that, you know, data is essentially um, the new oil. If, if you want to put it like that, there's a guy called Cl Clive Humby who I came across a while ago. And data is new oil. It's valuable, but if unrefined, it can't really be used. And that's the same with kind of geospatial data as well. So you feel this, all, all this point clouds data in, phone data, camera image data, RGB, um, SLAM GPS, um, sensors such as near infrared and thermal. But they don't really mean anything into kind of manipulate that those data sets into something a little bit um, a little bit more important and useful in terms of information out. And that could be, you know, is my model, is my reality to plan, scan to scan comparisons, are things in the right place at the right time? Do we need to do do we need to do anything within our project or our build to make sure that we um, um, mitigate that risk of ongoing future failures for in regards to clash detection and defect rectification and also program scheduling as well so are we on schedule if not how far are we deviating from the pro from the program and how what we can we do to to get back on track and that's just um, kind of a fairly limited number of ways to get information out but all tangible real valuable stuff that can really add value to a project the great thing here is you don't have to be an expert to get the answer you need. So current solutions at the moment require you to be a surveyor, requires you to be, have years of kind of experience behind you. Whereas what we try to do throughout the whole thing, and obviously like I mentioned earlier on in regards to our core value propositions, is that simplicity is key. So from picking up the scan to processing it, we need that simplicity as the thread running through. And it's about this job site connectivity as well. It's about connected job site, field office data and information flow capture on site seamlessly going to your office and processing it in near real time as well so you're not having to be the operator download it get on site go back to your office process it all locally and then start to inform your project team so we're looking to connect the dots and make things work more effectively and efficiently so this is something that we're going that we're working on at the moment um, and hopefully uh, within the next couple of months or year or so i can bring you something new with regards to this and uh, launch it to you guys so for for those who don't know about lidar and slam um great if you if you do apologies for um teaching you to to suck eggs but lidar is essentially uh, a light detection and ranging so that is the the kind of the hardware that allows us to kind of measure the environment so it's remote sensing method that uses light in the form of a pulse laser to measure ranges and that's essentially the kind of the base element to which we get our data you obviously have the IMU positional data as well, so the inter internal measurement unit. And with that together, we then feed that into Hub, which then you apply the SLAM algorithm to it. So SLAM algorithm stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. And this is something that is a, a real core key IP for GeoSlam. It's one of the best algorithms um, out there on the market at the moment, and it's very, very robust, which is fantastic for us because it gives us a core and it gives us a stable model, a stable point cloud when that is processed out for our customer base. And essentially, it takes 3D feature recognition and scan to scan registration and creates the point cloud very, very accurately. The benefits of that, of course, is that you don't need to remain static while scanning. So as you scan along, it's constantly looking for features that it recognizes. So it's very, very good. SLAM is very, very good within feature rich environments. So for a construction site, for a facilities management site, this is absolutely the right environment for it to be in because there's lots of different features in there in which the uh, which the scanner 
can recognize and start to process. And there's no need for GPS as well, so it's all local. The GPS, the adjustment to GPS, the adjustment to coordinates can be done, or adjustment to control can be done after the processing, but you don't need that at the time of scanning. Again, in areas where they, there may be no GPS signal, um, GSLAM and our, and our products work absolutely fine. And once you get all that done within Hub, you don't have your registered 3D point cloud in order for you to manipulate further on. Clever stuff. So in terms of SLAM applications, it's not just us that's doing it. There's a wide ranging base of applications in many industries and verticals. And most notably, you'll find it in autonomous vehicles. So you've got, you've got Uber, you've got Waymo, which is a kind of a subsidiary of Google. You've got Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, even Uber working with Volvo. You've got all these guys focusing on visual SLAM and have been harnessing quite large SLAM development teams. So these guys in terms of resource and development are way beyond uh, kind of where we are in terms of workflow and process. Um, so we're looking to work with these, uh, so work um, to try and build ourselves up to, uh, to understand how these guys are getting there and take learnings on in order to improve our technology and our solutions for, for the market. And also on top of kind of cars and services of like, you have security, data analytics, software, hardware and peripherals and connected car features. So there's a lot in there that SLAM and LiDAR sensors are used for beyond what I'm going to talk about today, which is obviously construction. So in terms of construction, what's the ongoing macro focus? Now, uh, my apologies, this is uh, one we focus on is, is the UK to a certain extent, because it's quite a mature market. And obviously for, for the Americas, the Americas, especially Northern America, is, is very mature, if not even more mature than the UK construction market. So there will be some kind of synergies and similarities between what I'm saying. So hopefully you're able to um, kind of understand what I'm talking about and have some um, some idea in terms of that matching with with the, the current environment within within the US. Um, so in, in the UK is a guy called Mark Farmer who did a, a quite comprehensive uh, and quite a, an interesting review on, on the UK construction labor model and talking about the, um, the, the construction industry kind of more holistically. And it was fairly brutal in his prognosis uh, and diagnosis of, of, of the UK. UK construction market. And they kind of identify kind of four key um, areas which need some real improvement if it's going to kind of pull itself out and start to be an innovator as opposed to a laggard when it comes to everything construction. One of them is low productivity. And it's not just a UK phenomenon, like I said. You know, there are upturns in UK productivity, and these tend to coincide with economic slowdowns as well. So you have your you have your boom and bust um, along with the economies. But there is a propensity, there's more kind of a, a Kind of a micro level uh, impact as well and some of this is is around propensity for clients to change their requirements late in the process which for main contractors can be an absolute pain um, and more and especially in the uk not sure if it was in america but in large scale re industry reworking and defects rectification so again to the end of the build and understand that there have been some fundamental errors uh, within the build that needs to be rectified. And this is um, kind of a, is a massive beacon or a massive um, kind of screen to say we need to be documenting and checking um, the, the the progression of build at more frequent period um, more frequent periods uh, during during the build. And this lends itself very nicely to kind of what GeoSlam offers as a solution. We talk about low pro uh, predictability in terms of key measurements: time, cost, quality. Uh, there is a failure instance which is a, has a correlation with building project technical complexity and in the UK because you know obviously the Americas you have a lot more land so you're able to build more lows more lows right low rise um, residentials healthcare facilities um, hospitals for example student accommodation hotels motels whereas the UK we're very confined for space especially around kind of city areas so we tend to build up to high rise as opposed to building out and what we're finding is that there the build completion for high rise is 33% versus 71% for low rise so the ability to finish these builds quickly on time and if the if the trend is heading towards high rise which it certainly is Building completion is absolutely poor. So we need ways in order to be able to predict better when things are going to be um, going off program and what we can do to, um, to adjust that. Again, GeoSlam can uh, work a solution in there. It's not the full solution, but it can, it can hopefully help um, kind of pro um, project managers, construction managers um, to understand 
uh, those elements a little bit better. It talks about structural fragmentation, so both vertically and horizontally. Self-employment is absolutely high in construction, 42% as opposed to 15% for the national UK average. And what happens is um, within the UK, there's simply a pinch point on main contractors where a lot of the um, a lot of weight sits on their shoulders when it comes to uh, either uh, getting the project done and being pulled in from the subcontractors and the architects and the clients developers if it's a more traditional project or if it's a design and build where the where the main contractor takes design responsibility then uh, there's even more pressure from the clients to get things done quickly on time and efficiently therefore that tends to lean towards a more cost focused rather than value focused industry and what happens, these main contractors are getting absolutely squeezed for everything. So they're trying to reduce costs. And typically when you reduce costs, you reduce quality and your timing in terms of your efficiency and effectiveness of the build goes, goes out the window. And typically in the UK, what you'll find is that maybe one to two percent um, margin um, is, is what they would typically enjoy. Gross margin, that is, they, that they would that they would enjoy. So as a byproduct of having a very, very poor bottom line, um, you're not able to take profits and reinvest into something which is going to improve. So what happens is a lack of R&D and investment in innovation. But in the UK, again, again, this, I guess this has been led from, from the US. Um, offsite is starting to be heralded as a game changer, but there's still some nervousness. In terms of a GeoSlam solution initially, uh, it will certainly be on site with regards to construction and facilities management. BIM is viewed as a critical change agent, um, but there's still a reality gap between the, the actual take up versus what has been perceived as, as the take up. Um, and, you know, investment in, in and adoption of, of BIM has been stymied purely because of, there is lack of uh, lack of money and focus because, it, again, it's coming back to this cost focus rather than a value focused industry. So there's, a, so there's a lot going on there and a lot to work on, but there's some things that I really feel that Geoslam can can add value to um, in, within these processes. And then what you do is um, there are failures. Uh, and uh, in the US, in the Americas, um, if you had noticed or seen uh, this, this is Grenfell Tower in, in London, it was, a, it was a, a, a tragedy, a real bad tragedy where, you know, there are a lot of failures through from the design process right up to the build. And it's understanding um, where the failures were and understanding what we could do in the future to mitigate those risks and those failures moving forward. And having solutions where you document the, 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 the build process at periodic times during regular times during the build to sense check and make sure that the graphical and non-graphical documentation is done and things are done to plan and design is absolutely crucial to make sure that the tragedies like this and loss of life does not happen moving forward. And out of that, there was a Hackett review, named Hackett, who uh, kind of gave a, a huge dossier on, 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 the, on, on the build and kind of what went wrong. And there's some things that I pulled out here. And one of these is a golden thread for all complex and high risk buildings. So the original design intent is preserved and recorded, original design intent. So this isn't going to the end of the build, which typically in the UK, you get to the build and then you do your as build and say, yeah, it's absolutely fine. Things will be missed, mistakes will be made. Humans are part of a project. Therefore, there is going to be human error somewhere. Not saying that we can uh, completely eradicate these, but we need to capture these as quickly as possible so we know about it, can change, uh, can understand where the deviation is from the original design intent and record what has been changed for future so they are able to look back and assess uh, or troubleshoot any issues that they may come across. Project as built to be documented. It needs to be documented. And this is the thing that's missing. Things aren't documented as frequently as they should be. BIM is one thing that is kind of a, the driver, the vehicle for this documentation, be it graphical or non-graphical. Um, but it needs to be a process on a digital platform and there needs to be take up, there needs to be cash, there needs to be some real um, urgency about this in order to um, pull construction through into and through the digital age. There are various conferences and, and uh, roundtables uh, about this as well. And people are kind of starting to mention, you know, that you know, um, in terms of digital records and effectively mandating 3D models, there's a huge opportunity for the industry to see if buildings are actually compliant at the design stage and beyond. Of course, things are going to be compliant at the design stage, or they should be, because you've had the time, you've got your desks 
Um, your desktop studies, they're done, they're designed, they're written by people that know better. Beyond that, when you're building, that's when you lose control and that's where you need to have a good process in place to be able to capture things at regular intervals to make sure that they are documented, foreseen and acted upon if they need be. A well-run build project allows us to reduce defects and hand over a huge amount of data. Now, it's about the reducing defects and understanding is absolutely fine. The handing over a huge amount of data is it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. Too much data, it's, it's not, um, it's counterproductive in, in some instances. And like I mentioned earlier on, it's not about the amount of data that you hand over, it's the information you glean from it and that, that adds value to your project, either during the project or beyond in the operational phase of a project. Um, in terms of industry stakeholders, they're client, obviously clients, developers, architects, main contractors and subcontractors. And for the focus of GSLAM, because you've got that pinch point, we tend to focus on the main contractors and architects for certain sense main contractors as well, which have overall objectives of speed, quality and cost control. This is These are the key elements that need to be met. And the key drivers behind this is ensuring the program runs smoothly as possible and to schedule. So this is by mitigating cost and risks that can impact this program on time, whilst maintaining close relationships with architects and subcontractors. So it's what technology, what methods, what processes can be implemented at main contractor stage, but have full oversight of the build and make sure that everything, like I mentioned before, is documented as frequently as possible without hindering the program schedule or disrupting any workflows that are in place at that point in time. So it's about speed and productivity. It's about quality and accuracy. It's about risk and predictability. It's about cost and reliability. All, um, I guess, 3D models, any kind of uh, reality capture uh, devices out there must meet all or mostly these, these elements here in order for it to be widely adopted and consumed within construction uh, industry and its respective verticals. So talking about uh, GeoSlam and what we what we can do at this moment in time for, for construction, like I said, the, the most important thing here is this is our evolving solution. So it's integrating in GeoSlam into your project, but evolving that integration and making sure that I'm talking to people here on this webinar today and getting your feedback, getting your insight and helping shape our solution for you moving forward. That for me is the most critical thing here. And it's about keeping it simple. And I'll keep harping on about this, but it really is about keeping it simple. It's one of the kind of key pillars within our core, within our value propositions. It's simplicity. And it's not just about the capture as well. It's it's a common thread all the way through uh, until you post process and manipulate that data set. And we want to have a continuous digital enablement with unrivaled non-invasive speed of capture. And that that captures the real essence about what GSLAM and our products can can give. But there are some considerations as well. So the first one is construction is not perfect. And we know construction is not perfect. Um, people are involved and therefore things don't go well when humans are involved. So what can we do to add value to make sure that we mitigate risks and that we uh, add value instantly from a cost and efficiency perspective? One of these things is about incremental operational improvement. If there are huge step changes in, in construction where typically it's quite a risk averse industry, the adoption of any kind of processes or methods or technology will not be as much as one would want. So it's about incremental operational improvement. It's about tailoring to both um, operational models. It's making sure workflows aren't disrupted, but they're kind of blended in nicely to really show that value. And that it doesn't matter if you're BIM immature or mature. It doesn't matter as long as we can um, improve your workflows incrementally and work with you to improve moving forward. That is the main thing. Another key thing here is speed and accuracy trade-off. I'll say it here uh, for, the, for the people that don't know about GSLAM, we don't offer sub-millimeter accuracy. So if you want one, two, under three millimeter accuracy, by all means, use surveyors, use these fantastic uh, terrestrial laser scanners that are out there on the market, which I'll cover in a bit. Um, they will give you the accuracy that you require. But what we need to do is get out of the mindset that everything we capture on site needs to be millimeter accurate. Of course, your structural elements, your steels, your, your concreting, for example, that supports the spine and the whole building, of course, they need to be sub-millimeter accuracy. It is imperative that they are 
where they need to be. When it talks about documenting the building, understanding where certain elements are, and are we on time, are we to schedule, are things in the right place from a non-structural perspective, that accuracy corridor widens a little bit, so the, the, the ability to have a, a high relative accuracy um, comes in, and that's where we can come in, and that's where we can turn that kind of data and information around very, very quickly compared to uh, current scanners on the market. And it's about this continual, digi continuous digital twinning as well. So like I keep saying, it's this constant documentation at key points during a build and capture reality and digitize that. And, it's, it, and, and essentially that enables effective management and decision making for moving forward for your organization and for your project. So our object and objectives, like I keep saying, simplicity, it's about speed and it's about um, streamlining your workflows as well. As I mentioned, there are many scanners in the market, and the majority of them are, are tripod based, they're heavy, they're time consuming to scan, but they do have fantastic accuracy, and I can't knock them because they are such good products. You've got Trimble, Topcon, Leica, Farrow, fantastic products. But they're tripod based, which means it slows you down. Um, and this is why mobile technology has its place within construction, not necessarily to displace these products or displace surveyors, because like I said, they certainly have their need. But for non-critical elements where you need to understand where a build is with a novice user, which can pick a scanner up. Um, I started GSLAM eight months ago and within a week I was up and scanning. And for me, I haven't come from, I'm, I'm from a construction background, but I'm not from a laser scanning background. And that's how easy it is to pick these um, so our scanners up and start to capture the, the environment around you. So where do we sit in amongst existing solutions? Um, I think um, the most widespread language to kind of communicate this uh, would be level of detail. So we typically sit between level of detail 200 and 300, depending on the environmental conditions. So sitting somewhere between the approximate geometry of an object and the precise geometry of, a, with a, of an object. And that is quite a nice space to sit if you want quick capture where accuracy isn't super um, important or required, such as obviously the position of structural steels, etc. When it gets to level um, LOD 400, yes, that's fabrication. That is where you need your tripod scanners, LED 500. That's where you need your as built from a graphical and non-graphical perspective. You absolutely need higher accuracy at those points in time. But during a build, you don't need that. And that's where you can save time and money in terms of efficiency on site. So what can we do with our LED? Well, as I mentioned before, it's actually quite a bit. So with consideration to the Royal Institute of Child Surveyors um, Survey Detail Accuracy Table Band, uh, we sit between D and E. So if you look at the accuracy soft detail, it's plus or minus 25 millimeters, millimeters to plus or minus 50 millimeters. So what, so what does that actually mean? So this is about engineering, surveying, and setting out. And this is most crucially about measured building surveys. And this is where we can add some real value. In terms of the products that we have, data acquisition speed, the Revo RT for internals, 43,000 points, the, uh, the Zeb Horizon, is 300,000 points per second for, for external. When we talk about relative accuracy, it's about plus or minus 15 to 20 millimeters, okay? And the absolute position accuracy is about 20 millimeters in a, in a building, dependent again on the, on the environment. And your minimum max range is from 0.5 up to 100 meters, depending on the products that you obviously use. So we're in a really good position to offer some value. And in essence, our solutions depict a couple of things. One is the structural elements of the build, not the, not the exact positioning, but the fact that they are there. And you can then take that to say, are they there on time and to plan in terms of a 4D element of a project plan? You can capture other non-load bearing elements, such as partitions, kind of drywall partitions, risers, stairwells, um, kind of uh, lift risers, um, lift shafts, service risers, for example. All these parts that tend to be not load bearing and therefore the relative accuracy can be um, can be relaxed a little bit. We can catch those and with a, a good degree of confidence, say whether they're in the right position or not, giving you that extra information and value that you need. To about architectural features as well. So facades and cladding uh, is, is great using the, the horizon and also the cameras that we have. Floor, uh, floor plans, elevations, cross sections. And when it comes to kind of multi-residential hotel student accommodation, where the, the client developer are developing a building where there is a commercial, a real commercial um, angle to that particular project, gross internal error and net internal error are absolutely crucial. The gross internal error to make sure that everything fits in 
um, within our space uh, and to plan, but most crucially is the net internal area as well. So it's the, within those units, are you building to plan and giving the potential either tenants or buyers the space that they have bought as per the marketing um, from that client and developer? In the UK at the moment, there is an absolutely, there's, there's a massive thing around undervaluing and overvaluing um, um, uh, properties uh, based on the um, the inability to measure in that internal area and uh, correctly, and that can impact the the purchase price of of a, of a property by thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars. So it's making sure we get this right, and we certainly are able to be able to deliver that in a timely manner. And it's about contextualization as well. So beyond the point cloud capture, beyond laser scanning, it's about capturing that high quality image to contextualize the environment in which you're capturing your data within. So in terms of data set creation, we have a scan to point cloud, um, and this is kind of reality captured. So on the left hand side, you can see in the video, this is the Reva RT that's, uh, that's scanning in the moment. What's critical about this is it gives you that real time feedback. There are a couple of nice features on there in terms of the time of the scan, um, uh, where you are positionally, but also most crucially is this kind of traffic light system indicating the health of the scan. So if it's green, you're good to go. If it's amber or red, there are certain uh, point cloud density within the area that you just passed that you might need to go and revisit. So the, the Reva RT is happy that you capture enough to give you a, a good enough, high quality enough data set. And once you've captured that, obviously then you have your point cloud data set, which looks something like this. So this is the capture of a uh, of a restaurant. So obviously the internals and the external as well, out to the foliage as well and the surrounding estate areas. And it's green nice here. You can see the you can see the obviously the roof, the elevation of the roof, the dormer cheeks, the internals. You're able to see the internal partitions. You're able to see the structural elements in terms of the horizontal and also vertical structures. You can see the fixtures, fittings, and equipment as well in the form of um, benches and chairs. You can see the, the ceilings. You can see the lamp lampshades. You can see the floors as well. So there's a lot of detail in there that gets captured. But essentially, point clouds are a blizzard of points. There are no, there's no value attached to this. It may look like a restaurant and it captures reality. Absolutely, it looks like a building, it looks great. But honestly, does it give you any value? Not really. And this is why we need to be taking another step beyond this once we've captured this. But the initial capture is fantastic. And that was all captured on foot at walking pace within 10 minutes, which is absolutely incredible. We have another capture here as well, which is an office block. And this is captured with the Revo RT. So the one previously was the Horizon. This is the Revo RT, which is more for internal environments. And as we zoom in here, we can always see the see the um, the lighting in lighting panels up in the ceiling as well. We can see the kind of non load bearing elements within there. So we can see the partition, we can see the positioning of it, we can see the ceilings, we can see the walls. And when we're zooming around, we can again pick up those fixtures, fittings, and equipment. But crucially, remember that the capture that we have is LOD 200 to 300. So we're not looking at that high quality fabrication and as built. We're looking at precise, um, we're looking at kind of uh, basic or precise geometry of the position of things that allows us to sit within that corridor of relative accuracy that we operate within. So again, like I said, it's just a blizzard of points. And what we need to do is we need to make some sense of them. So what we do is we take that data set and we plug it into uh, GSLAM Hub, which takes that point cloud, processes it, and gives us something useful. So this video here talks about draw, and it's been sped up for the purpose of this webinar. But what we're taking here is we have the scan of a building, your side elevation, and we'll take a cross section of that. And what we'll do is we then create a 2D floor plan of that particular area. And there's a couple of things we can do. So we can take the net internal area of those particular units, which you can see now, or we can take the gross internal area of that particular environment. We can also vectorize that. So vectorize your whole work in drawing and make it um, DWG or DXF ready to export into either Revit um, or other kind of design software packages that you may be using AutoCAD uh, as an example of that. Um, that was obviously sped up. It gives you just a flavor of what um, of what draw in its basic in its basic form can offer from a 2D floor plan and GIA net, net internal error assessment perspective. If you do want more information and more in-depth uh, look at draw and its capabilities from a floor plan perspective and beyond, there are other webinars that you can um, 
that you can look to visit. And I'll give you the, the web link for that later on. So moving from 2D to 3D, what else can we do with it? So we have a, a plugin um, for Revit plugin or for CAD plugin, and this basically takes the, the point cloud data and uh, concurrently starts to plot that within Revit. So if we look at this example here, we've got a, kind of the a window pane, uh, selecting the points there, and as you can see on the right hand side, that has then been uh, popped into, into the 3D Revit model. From this, what you can do is you can build very simple 3D models um, in, in Reddit. And again, it's basically taking that 2D and turn it into that 3D model. So if you're looking again for gross internal error, net internal error, where your partitions are built, where your doors are, where your windows are, for example, this is perfect in order to be able to capture that particular environment. Regardless of what floors you've got, if you've got uh, two floors up to 20 floors, you can build that in with capture that we have. Um, the great, yeah, like I said before, the great thing about this is measuring that gross internal error and also that net internal error as well. So it's very, very quick, very, very effective way of building that simple BIM model up. Adding another layer to that is, is again, like I mentioned, this is contextualization. So it's geotag imagery within a point cloud data set. So this on the left hand side, this is kind of a very, very raw point cloud um, uh, floor plan with uh, RevRT, and the right-hand side is a kind of a nondescript um, plant room that we that we captured with the, the, the pano. So as you see here, the imagery is very very good. The lighting conditions are favourable, but it was quite dark in some places. But the the camera that we have is able to deal with that and still give a a, a great a great uh, image back. As you can see there, what we're working on at the moment is a sneak peek of some kind of future development that we're working on. Is this anonymization uh, techniques as well. So making sure that we have the ability to um, automatically um, detect facial features and faces and block them out for anonymization purposes. This is also very good for areas where uh, you've got kind of high security. So for the UK Ministry of Justice, uh, Ministry of Defence. Uh, so for so for the Americas, you kind of army, naval, air force bases, for example, where you need to mask out faces, but not just faces, uniforms as well. So it's looking at your uh, your names, your badges, your insignias, for example, all that can be masked. And it doesn't just, just go to people as well. It talks about, kind of, uh, we talk about uh, looking to develop it in terms of asset recognition as well. So we can do machine, apply machine learning and artificial intelligence and AI to uh, start to kind of pick and mask certain objects that we've asked it to um, when the image is, is processed. So very powerful and something we're working on to improve daily. When it comes to uh, when it comes back to obviously the 3D model creation, there's some other cool things that we can do with it as well. So left hand side, you've kind of built your model uh, using a two, using a 2D floor plan, but you can also do it in another way as well. So you can actually mesh um, you can actually mesh your point cloud data. So on the right hand side, what you can see here is kind of an IFC classified mesh, and in there you can see your walls, you can see your floors, you can see your ceilings, and also you can see the MEP, so the uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing elements in the ceiling elements. And you can create a kind of a hybrid approach within within Revit in order to overlay the mesh with the model to give you a, a better view of, of exactly what's there at the moment of time that the the data was captured. And again, just showing here the kind of the, the meshing as well and the classification. So we have the ce we have the kind of the ceiling uh, or the soffit in, in in pink. We have the structural elements in the kind of the amber and, and the blue the walls in the green and the kind of the, the, the piping in there as as the yellow as well. And the right hand side again, just overlaying that with the models to show positionally where things are. And that can obviously impact coordination of service as well. So there's a scan to plan com com comparison to ascertain actual object positioning relative to the model. So like I said, LOD 200 and 300. So we are, you can be restricted by what is captured. So if you're looking to capture, I don't know, um, quarter of ridge pipe, um, you, you're gonna be struggling there. If you're looking to capture half an inch, three quarter inch, inch pipe, two inch pipe, whatever it is, conduit cable trays, for example, fantastic. The Revo will pick it up and we have that ability to mesh. You can then take that mesh Overlay that with your model and works for model checking to make sure things are in the right place at the right time. And if not, why not? And start to plan accordingly from there. We do have a couple of use cases as well. So an airport baggage handling area. This was scanned in about 15 to 20 minutes. And the objective here was to understand the area and see if they can incorporate another belt in order to improve the efficiency of the airport due to an increase in passenger um, 
footfall through the terminal. And through that, they obviously captured the um, point cloud and they were able to turn that into a very representative, highly accurate 3D model. And the upshoot of this was that they were able to get in another baggage belt using the scan and using the 3D model that they created, therefore improving the efficiency of their terminal. Another, another use case is kind of um, MEP within the ceiling void, so understanding reality and modeling it as well. So it's these full ceilings between the soffit and the ceiling, and what's lying in between us is pipes, your conduits, your um, air conditioning units, your, your cable trays. And on the right hand side, you can see the scan that was conducted with the Revo RT. And at the bottom of that, again, it's a nice LOD 200, 300 model there, showing approximate and precise geometry of certain features within that. As obviously the build progresses, you then get to build that, that data and that model up more until you get your as built for handover into operational use. But again, just illustrating what you can do with a handheld scanner that you can take at a walking pace. Now, what I've done just to kind of bring some kind of context to what I'm talking about here, um, I've created a, a, a fake or an imaginary uh, hostel here. Uh, and um, what we've done is we've broken it down. So there are now seven areas in this in this in this hospital. Total area is ten and a half thousand square meters. So I've, um, apologies, I've done it in square meters as opposed to square foot. Um, so you'd have to do your your calculations beyond that. But you'll be able to get this presentation afterwards and, and do the calculations. But from a square foot perspective, let's take area one, which is two over two and a half thousand square feet. I want to say the average walking pace is about uh, a meter a second for a normal person. Um, it's actually it's more like 1.4 so we slowed it down a little bit here just to kind of add some delay to to the scan which covers around about 1200 square meters per scan and when we talk about scans we tend to uh, advise um, stopping every 20 minutes for two reasons one is to give the operator a bit of a rest when walking around and secondly it's about um, minimizing that data set size okay so it's breaking it down to bite-sized chunks to make sure you haven't got this enormous data set after hours of scanning so what that means is about 2.5 scans. I've added about 20% onto that just to kind of allow for kind of um, stopping, allowing for kind of toilet breaks or kind of whatever it is between between scans. So two and a half scans, call it three scans. So it's around about 50 minutes under an hour, so call that, call that around about an hour to scan that entire area, which is which is fantastic. And when we talk about processing hours, that's the processing within GSLAMP Hub. So it tends to, it tends to be a one-to-one -one or one-to-two depending on the data set. So let's do that as well. So 1.7 hours to process, and again, another 1.7 hours to process or to manipulate that data set within any design software uh, or model checking software that you may be working with. Add that all up, there's only about 4.2 hours of scan to manipulation to answer. So if we think about this particular area, we've had a project meeting, let's say for example, the night before, and it was an agreement that area one would be scanned in the morning to understand the state of play within that particular area, okay? You have your answer, so from picking up the scanner to manipulation and turn that data into something useful, valuable in terms of information, is about 4.2 hours. So you have your answer by the end of the morning. Then you can then inform your site teams in the afternoon in terms of what the next steps are. Uh, so like I said, this is an example, um, but I've added in a lot of a lot of time in here. So actually, this is I would say this is probably worst case scenario for our scanners. The more you use it, the more effective and efficient you become it. You're able to cut down those those hours. And if we look at the total site as well, ten and a half thousand square meters. If you look at your from your scan time. So you have about 10 scans to be able to do that to that kind of area, 204 minutes, just, uh, just under three and a half hours. And in terms of process and manipulation, it's about 17 hours. So if you take a 7.5 hour working day, it's just under two and a half days. So scan your whole site, two and a half days within a week, and then you can then look to kind of progress uh, your project teams moving forward with regards to any kind of um, deviations or, or alterations they need to be making to their work or understand everything's going great, which is fantastic, but that rarely happens, so uh, we'll, we'll go with the former. But that just shows how quick the turnaround is, and typically what happens, you rely on surveyors to capture this data, and there seems to be a long wait between acquiring the uh, surveyor for him to make be available to get onto site. Um, you're lucky if you do have a surveyor on site to call upon, but then it's, it's taking those scans using uh, tripod-based scanners, and uh, processing that and manipulating that. And that tends to be weeks rather than days. We can compress that to days and compress that to hours as well. So there's real value using our product 
in the right time and at the right place as well. So some kind of key takeaways and a quick wrap up here. And it's talking about construction is that I feel it's at a digital tipping point. There needs to be some maturity and adoption, and this will determine the digital development moving forward. You know, the main drivers for adoption, speed, productivity, quality and accuracy, risk and predictability, and cost and reliability. And we need to be covering those to give people the real confidence that a solution is the right solution for them. There is a clear need to capture reality as frequently as possible. It's about documenting as frequently as possible. So um, defects are caught early, clashes are caught early, and there's no program slippage. And what it is, that can be rectified. And you don't have the tragedies that we had at uh, Granville. And I'm not saying laser scanning will stop that kind of thing, but it will certainly help towards maintaining and updating that kind of document, um, the documentation of, of the build. And accuracy is always a key question, but for me, it ultimately comes down to the question, what is the balance between pinpoint accuracy and speed of action, or speed of capture? If you want absolute pinpoint accuracy everywhere on your build, fantastic, but you're not going to be able to capture the rates that will make it efficient and effective for you and give you that vital information back. There needs to be a balance between the two, and it's understanding where that balance lies and where we as mobile scan technology can insert ourselves within your organizations and also your workflows on site as well. So just kind of wrap up on GeoSlam, it's well established, we're a market leader mobile scanning solution, and we have a range of solutions which enable the effective capture of any internal or external environment. Like I mentioned, LOD 200, 300 for the scans, and it's by integrating that into workflows to generate some value from that. We have multiple use cases available to illustrate the value we have added to kind of industries and verticals. So please contact us on info at geoslam.com and we'll be able to uh, be gladly to kind of share that with you so you can kind of see um, from a real life perspective as opposed to me making up um, a random hospital. And our hardware and software solutions integrates in existing workflows and doesn't hinder or complicate. And that's the key thing, it integrates, embeds itself with minimum disruption. I've been here for eight months and I'm genuinely really excited about the future for GSLAM, enjoying every single minute of it. Like I said, we have a new product team, which is absolutely fantastic. We have a full development roadmap currently being worked upon that will continue to add high value to customers and continue to push those boundaries. But in order to push those boundaries, it's about me asking something for you. So thank you very much for joining this webinar. Um, it's It's been great to have you here, but if you're able to spend some time and um, answer some of these questions for me at some point, that'd be absolutely fantastic. So for me, it's understand your pains and your gains. So existing processes, what's costly in terms of effort, time, and money? What are the main difficulties and challenges currently encountered? What mistakes happen? What are the current frustrations and annoyances that you come across? And what are the current risks that current, that exist within your organization and projects when it comes to construction projects? And again, so what, what ultimately you're after, not and also the kind of the end game, but also what are those incremental uh, things that you want in order to kind of um, boost efficiency, productivity, time, effort, and money? What do you attach most value to? What levels um, of quality are you expecting? Uh, generally, any new kind of technology and process implemented, and what would make what would make your lives easier from a capture, from a manipulation, from a processing perspective? Whether you're a project manager, construction manager, BIM manager, VDC manager, design manager, whatever you are, what uh, would make your jobs easier from a scanning perspective? And how is success and failure measured within your organisation? And what would help you adopt GeoSlam technology? For me, is it about lowering risk? Is it quality, better quality? Is it time or is it decreased kind of effort in order to capture kind of what you want? So the more these I can answer these questions, uh, the better our process is, the better our products will be moving forward and therefore we'll be able to align ourselves to your needs now and into the future. So thank you very much. I'm just going to double check to see if there are kind of any questions that have been posted uh, in the polls. They said you had a slide about viewing the scanned area from the 3D camera. You have to stop walking to generate these photospheres. What is the smallest step size that can be generated between these photospheres? The step size, it can be anything really. It's a meter, it's two meters. It purely depends. And sorry, thank you for that, Joe. It really depends on the frequency in which you want to capture. Um, for me, it's about capturing every two, three, four meters. Um, but that's obviously within those kind of confined areas that you saw in that plant room. When you come to bigger expanses, such as a building site where you've got the kind of internals exposed, for example, it's kind of down to you as to the level of detail that you want to capture with those photos. 
because it's about contextualizing that environment and it's about having the right imagery in order to understand kind of any uh, kind of workmanship uh, issues that you may have and how you go about verifying that either whether you're at site with the with the contra uh, with the construction manager or whether you're relying purely on images in order to be able to ascertain whether the 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 plan and the designs have been installed correctly so hopefully that answers your your question joe but again if you like to, if you like to discuss this any further please email me lee.hamilton at geoslam.com and i'll be happy to uh, take a conversation with you and talk about this in a little bit more detail so if there's if there's no more questions i'd just like to say thank you very much indeed thanks for joining this webinar and please sign up for more webinars at geoslam.com forward slash webinar until then thank you very much have a great week great weekend i look forward to hopefully speaking to you soon either in person or digitally take care thank you very much